Hi everyone, I'm Michael Millerman and this is Millerman Talks. Today I'd like to talk to you about Julius Evola's Notes on the Third Reich, a follow-up to his book Fascism Viewed from the Right, which I've discussed on this channel before. Notes on the Third Reich was originally published in 1974. Its intention is to highlight the multiplicity and even the heterogeneity of the components of National Socialism, as Evola writes at the end of the study. My goal is to give you a comprehensive overview of his book and therefore of his assessment of Nazism and Hitler. I'll be quoting extensively from the book throughout. If you find this kind of presentation helpful, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Evola begins by giving three reasons why it's more difficult in the case of Nazism than in the case of fascism to distinguish between intrinsically valid principles and contingent elements. First, the negative elements that are generally emphasized when people speak of Nazism concentration camps, persecution of Jews, responsibility for starting the Second World War, Hitler's ideas, all of that should be separated from the rest. For Evola, in other words, we cannot, in his view, start our analysis with the things that are most often emphasized and that are front and center, because in standing out so starkly, they may keep out of sight other things that are important to understand. Not that those things are unimportant, but that they can block our access to other also important aspects of Nazi policy and principles. Second, the central and overwhelming role that was held by a given individual in Germany, even more than in Italy, has cast everything else into shadows for many, as Evola puts it. In other words, although it's natural for us to want to focus on Hitler when talking about National Socialism, doing so can stop us from assessing adequately the various principles that were in play. Whereas identification and analysis of principles is what Evola is particularly concerned to do well. So we must guard against having Hitler's shadow cast so completely over the study that nothing else is visible. Again, not to diminish his importance, and in fact, we'll see naturally that he does come out in Evola's remarks, but you just want to control for his dominating presence and make sure that you readjust or calibrate so that you can see the other parts of the picture as well. Finally, in the case of the Third Reich abroad, but also in contemporary Germany, the entire period from the end of the Weimar Republic to the Second World War has hastily been called Nazism, quoting Evola here, as if we were dealing with something completely unitary and homogenous. There's no appropriate consideration, he writes, of the particular factors that played a role in the birth and construction of the Third Reich with the notable tensions and divergences that subsisted behind the totalitarian structure. So we've come to consider the whole period under one name, and that may prevent us from getting into the notable tensions and divergences. So for these reasons, Evola considers it necessary first to review the antecedents and the complex ideological and political situation in Germany before Hitler came to power, which he begins to do in chapter one, to which we now turn. The social chaos that was the inevitable consequence of Germany's defeat the collapse of the previous regime, the disastrous clauses of the Versailles Treaty, and the growing unemployment all led to a situation where communist ideas were being taken more seriously than ever before in Germany. In these circumstances, Hitler tried to bring German workers to national socialism by drawing them away from international socialism, which had found its place in Germany after World War I due to the inadequacy, weakness, and inconsistency of the social democratic and liberal political forces of the parliamentary Weimar Republic. However, nationalism in Germany did not have the same meaning it had in Western Europe, and it is in the folkish idea that we can see the precursor that played an important role in Hitlerism. Hitler, Evola writes, was always talking about the folk, the Volksgemeinschaft, or community understood in terms of the folk, a race people, will be the slogan of this Third Reich, where it will play a rather problematic role. That's from page 20. For Hitler, the national was not opposed to the social. Thus, while Marxism was an anti-national movement fatal to German peoplehood, the appeal to German national and racial pride was itself, first of all, essentially thinking of the masses and the working class. The alternative then is not national versus social, since German nationalism was itself social. This was, therefore, the first component of Nazism, according to Evola, its mass, working class, national character. The next point to which Evola draws our attention is that the situation in Germany was different from the situation in Italy. Italian fascism did not have any deeply rooted tradition to go back to when it came to fighting red subversion and putting the state back on its feet. 
quoting Evola there. In Germany, however, remnants survived with deep roots in that hierarchical world, which was at times still feudal, focused on the values of the state and its authority, and these traditions that were part of an earlier tradition, in particular Prussianism. And even before Hitler, there had been those intellectuals who, beginning from that traditional legacy, sought to promote a movement that wanted to restore and at the same time to renew. The goal to restore and at the same time to renew, this combination of a renewing restoration, was the source of the frequently used formula of conservative revolution, which was not simply a return to yesterday, but rather a revolution as the elimination of the negative. If you don't already know, the conservative revolutionaries were a group of what we might call internal dissidents to National Socialism who opposed it from the right. And here, Evola is identifying alongside with the folkish strand of thought, the conservative revolutionary strand of thought. And here he quotes Arthur Mueller Vandenbroek's remark that to be conservative does not mean to remain attached to what has been, but to live and act starting from what has a lasting value. Indeed, the term Third Reich itself comes from Mueller Vandenbroek's 1923 book called Germany's Third Empire, or in German, Reich. Among the German conservative revolutionary thinkers who preceded and partially influenced Hitler, there was a spiritual orientation, and the emphasis was placed on a revolution that was above all spiritual. Besides folkish nationalism and conservative revolutionary thinking, Evola mentions another current that presented aspects that were mostly existential. Its origin, he writes, must be brought back to what was called the generation of the front line, especially of those combatants who saw the war as an experience, a test that in the best of them had provoked the process of purification and liberation. For instance, in Ernst Jünger. For Jünger, the Great War had been destructive and nihilistic only in relation to everything that is mere rhetoric. The idealism of big hypocritical words, the bourgeois conception of existence. Besides these theoretical influences, folkish thinking, conservative revolution, and here the frontline existentialism of people like Junger, were political groups of veterans of the national right, and all this together formed the general context for the anti-Marxist and non-democratic Germany before the National Socialist Party established itself on the national scene. Evola writes that if there had been an agreement among the various currents, and especially if there had been men with the stature of leaders capable of confronting the situation, a conservative revolution would have been possible. But as it happens, things went in another direction. He discusses the perpetration of excesses that came in the wake of the burning of the Reichstag as a result of the fact that the subsequent decree for the protection of the people in the state was enforced not only by the police, but also by Hitler's paramilitary brown shirts. If we are to formulate a judgment from the general point of view of the right, he writes, we should say that in every state worthy of the name, and every state properly speaking, measures like this one are necessary under certain circumstances. It's because nothing similar took place in Italy, to the greater glory of the holy democracy, that the cancer represented by communism and its fellow travelers has spread to an alarming degree in post-war Italy and has sunk roots so deep that its extirpation seems unlikely without a civil war. Yet, Evola is critical of the law that conferred full powers on Hitler, the enabling law. More precisely, he says that it should not have lasted from 1933 until 1945. Even without adhering to the fetish of the so-called rule of law of liberal inspiration, he reasons, we ought to see this situation as excessive. It is not right to perpetuate and virtually institutionalize what can be legitimate only in particular temporary situations. The ethical bonds which are necessarily indeterminate and elastic between the responsibility held by one part from on high and trust and fidelity by the other cannot replace definite statements of law that even in an authoritarian state of the right must be established to prevent dictatorial leaders. In other words, as he argued in his book, Fascism Viewed from the Right, a temporary dictator is not incompatible with the true doctrine of the state, but the dictator should not become absolute and permanent. Even worse, Evola regards Hitler's rule as a dictatorship based on the masses and on a rejection of the king, whereas correct dictatorship, in his view, is not based on mass support and is only a temporary interruption in the rule of a king. Indeed, Evola harshly criticizes Hitler for his unparalleled vulgarity 
when it comes to hating the monarchy. Evola also criticizes as anti-traditional Hitler's unification of the German state, to the extent that it was premised on destroying the individual regional entities that in their partial autonomy and sovereignty corresponded to the various kingdoms, principalities, and free cities of the federation of which the Second Reich was composed. This system of a superior central authority combined with a small group of political units that enjoy partial autonomy and that have an organic and qualitative character, Evola thinks that kind of system reflects the principles of the true state better than the leveling centralization that Hitler affected. This is a recurring point in Evola's two books. Partial autonomy that preserves qualitative differences is a principle compatible with the right, whereas totalitarian centralization is not. We next turn to the issue of leadership. In Nazism, everything gravitated around a man with exceptional abilities for captivating, transporting, arousing, and fanaticizing the people, while he himself presented under more than one aspect the traits of a possessed person, as if an extraordinary force were acting through him, giving him lucidity and iron logic in action, but depriving him of every sense of limit. Just as he had done in the case of fascist Italy, Evola criticizes Nazi Germany's cult of leadership, which was no substitute for sound political principles. The complete ideological collapse of Germany after 1945, he writes, shows how superficial was the effect of Hitler's magnetic action on the masses, despite the power of myths and the strict totalitarian organization. So there was a complete ideological collapse when you took Hitler out of the equation. And yet the ideology or worldview of the Third Reich was not even worth preserving, according to Evola, since it contained many inconsistencies and was on the whole muddy, confused, and out of line with the true teaching. But we'll come to that shortly, to his assessment of the worldview of Nazism. Evola points out that when Hitler created the unified German state through the anti-traditional measures of leveling centralization, the diverse thinkers of the conservative revolution realized the gap that existed between their ideals and the new state seeing in this state a falsification or profanation of their ideals and blaming it for a break with the preceding tradition. Some of them left Germany while others stayed to try to exert an influence over the development of Nazism. Now, this is an important point because it shows us that the thinkers of the conservative revolution were critics of national socialism from the right or from the side of tradition. Usually or often fascism and national socialism are treated together as the far right end of a political spectrum where you have liberalism, then communism to its left, and Nazism and fascism to its right. That model, of course, does not leave any conceptual space for the conservative revolution as non-fascist, non-Nazi, right-wing anti-liberalism and anti-communism. One of the reasons we should read Evola as well as the thinkers he influenced is to remind ourselves that there's more to the political spectrum than is implied by the model of three political theories. The next topic for us to consider is the relationship of the state to the people or the place of the state in Nazi policy. As I discussed in my video on fascism viewed from the right, Evola believes that the state should be preeminent in relation to the people. He's critical of Hitlerism because for Hitler, the state was conceived as a secondary and instrumental reality, while the primary formative moving and bearing force was supposed to be the folk with the Fuhrer as its representative and incarnation. This difference between Italian fascism and German National Socialism concerning the preeminence of the state helps to distinguish the two movements at the doctrinal level. The state is primary in fascism, but secondary in Nazism. In this context, Evola quotes Ernst von Solomon's opinion that every attempt to move the essential accent from the state to the people, from authority to the collective, should be considered an absurd and abject betrayal of the true goal of the national movement. There could not be any bridge between the state idea and the populist one of the essence of the nation. Yet, in their aversion to demagoguery, the German right, who had the truer teaching, the conservative revolutionaries had the truer teaching, but in their aversion to demagoguery, they proved politically inferior to Hitler, who was able to politicize and fanaticize a mass movement through propaganda. And whereas the right had hoped to make use of Hitler, the opposite happened. Such successes as the German state did have, Evola argues, were due to its unique combination of folk and Fuhrer on one hand, a combination to repeat that's not in accordance with the traditional state, and on the other hand, the legacy of Prussian dispositions among the people and among the administration. These dispositions included 
a love for discipline, and the spirit of impersonal and eventually heroic dedication and fidelity, which Evola regards as distinct from blind fanaticism. However, the Prussian disposition was not enough to counteract certain plebeian tendencies in Nazism and in Hitler himself. For instance, Evola criticizes the tendency in German National Socialism to provide so much social assistance to the lower classes that they are guaranteed a maximum of bourgeois comfort, as he puts it. And he expresses distaste for all Hitler's talk about the nobility of labor, because from the viewpoint of the right, as he understands it, the state should not romanticize the workers, the masses, or the lower classes. To show this similarity of Nazism and communism with respect to its positive assessment of the masses, Evola mentions the following old joke. What's the difference between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia? The Soviet state is proletarian and the Nazi state is proletarian. In other words, both are based on the working classes, but in the German case, it's the Aryan working class. Evola writes that the presence of a proletarian aspect in Nazism is undeniable, as in the figure of Hitler himself, who had none of the traits of a gentleman of an aristocratic type. This vulgar proletarian character runs counter to what the traditional right expects from its leadership and from its doctrine of the state. In other words, it runs counter to the elite aristocracy of noble souls. Similarly, Evola criticizes Nazi initiatives at consolidating the social community under the banner of the folk to the extent that these initiatives made voluntary work obligatory and ended up thoughtlessly and counterproductively mixing the nobility with the peasants in a failed attempt at political national education. Incidentally, if you want to read something truly amazing about what can happen when the nobility and the peasants mix, have a look at Book 8 of Plato's Republic sometime, where he discusses the transformation of oligarchy into democracy, and the turning point of that transition is somehow the mixing of the nobility and the peasants. It's worth considering what Plato says in relationship to what Evola says as we think through these issues. Evola turns next to economic policy, where he finally has some nice things to say. He speaks supportively of Hitler's war against the trade unions, praising in completely positive terms the occupation of union headquarters, the arrest of trade union leaders, and the confiscation of union property, as well as the Nazi party's opposition to finance capitalism, which he opposes to entrepreneurial or productive capitalism. He likewise sees in Nazi economics some salutary limits, on the principle of leveling integration, since the state left scope for the development of private industry and did not undertake the wholesale nationalization of all businesses. Evola finds positive features in the trade policy of the Third Reich as reflected in the following phrase from the time, we should not buy from countries where the goods are cheapest, but instead from those where we can pay for them primarily with our own exports. In other words, he endorses the principles of autarky and independence. And although, as we have seen, he does not condone Hitler's vulgar proletarianism, Evola does consider positive the Third Reich's defense of the dignity of the peasant farmer, as well as state protection of the inalienable hereditary plot or farm, which was transmitted to preserve through the generations, lest it fall into the hands of the class of wealthy bourgeois speculators. These various economic initiatives evince a healthy anti-modern spirit and are to be judged among the most positive features of the Third Reich, according to Evola. The next major topic that he discusses after economy is race. The party program distinguished between the juridical category member of the state on one hand and the biological or racial category of true citizen on the other. Hitler, Evola writes, had considered scandalous the fact that for so long the ethnic racial concept of citizenship was not taken into account. That acquisition of citizenship could take place no different from admission to an automobile club. That is, that all it would take is a request so that by the decision of a bureaucrat, something happens that not even heaven can do. By the stroke of a pen, a Zulu or Mongol becomes a pure German. Hitler had said that an ethnically German street sweeper was more honorable than a foreign king. This is an idea that for Evola, reflects Hitler's purely plebeian spirit. Moreover, for Hitler, the state was a vehicle or vessel whose primary purpose it was to hold and protect the race so that the state is not an end but a means, namely the means by which a superior race produces a superior culture. So in the Nazi teaching, the state exists to defend the race, 
and the race is noble by the mere fact of being that race. These are all ideas that Evola does not share and that he thinks are wrong-headed. In fact, he's quite critical of Nazi race theory. The role that myth played in all this is clear, he writes, as well as it's confusing the concept of race with the concept of nation, which ends up basically democratizing and degrading the former. Further, no thought was given, Evola writes, to defining in positive, even spiritual terms, the concept of Aryan. It implicitly allowed every German to think that he was preeminently the Aryan to whom was attributed the creation and origin of every higher culture. This was the incentive for a baleful arrogance that was more than nationalist and completely foreign to the traditional right. Although some of the upper Nazi echelons held that within the German race, there was a higher elite Nordic element, this idea could not but lead to ironic reflections among the people, since, as Evola writes, Hitler was not at all a pure Nordic type, nor were his closest collaborators and the heads of the party. Hitler's view that a German street sweeper was more honorable than a foreign king, Evola calls a demagogic aberration. He's not opposed to the idea of rank or superiority, provided that the stress is on spiritual rank and superiority. Excessive emphasis on biological race can lead to a lifeless, spiritually bastardized racial purity. Now, of course, we cannot consider Hitler in the issue of race without saying something about Hitler's policies toward the Jews. So Evola naturally turns to that topic next. We should recognize, he writes, that in Hitler, anti-Semitism played the role of a true idee fix, of which in this almost paranoid aspect, it is not possible to completely explain its origins and which had tragic consequences. In his writings and speeches, Hitler over and again attributes to the Jew the cause of every evil. He truly believed that the Jew was the only obstacle to the creation of an ideal German national society, and he made this obsession an essential ingredient in his propaganda. Apart from Marxism, still quoting Evola here, for Hitler, all Bolshevism has been the creation and tool of Judaism. The same holds true for Western capitalist plutocracy and the Masons. These are all theses, Evola notes, of which he, Hitler, should have recognized the one-sided character early on. We may wonder whether Hitler in his fixation was not the victim of one of the tactics we have elsewhere called the occult war, a tactic consistent with turning all our attention to concentrate only on one particular sector where the fighting forces are active, while distracting our attention from the other sectors where their activity can continue almost undisturbed. That was all quoting Evola. Evola does not deny the existence of a Jewish problem, but he's critical of the obsessive fanaticism with which it was treated in Germany. In some professional fields, he objects it would be difficult to prove that being a Jew gives a particular undesirable stamp to the relevant activity, whereas the Nazis assumed that Jewishness as a way of being as such was everywhere detrimental for Germany and Germans. Evola does suggest that there may be characteristics of Jewishness as a way of being that should be avoided, or against which it would be necessary to protect oneself. But in this work, he doesn't go into details on that point. Instead, he finishes the discussion on race and the Jewish question with the following sentence. We need to remember that if we can indicate the presence of Jews in various modern intellectual, ideological, and artistic currents that incontestably entail subversion and denaturing, this activity would never have been possible unless the terrain had been prepared for quite some time not by Jews, but by Aryans, and often in irreversible terms. So you see, he blames ultimately not the Jews, but the worst sort among the Germans themselves for preparing the grounds of their own subversion. The last thing I want to say about this section is that Evola mentions Paul Lagarde's separation of the Jew who was faithful to his own tradition, whom Lagarde respected to a certain degree, from the secularized modern Jew, for it is the secularized modern Jew, according to Evola, to whom were attributed rootless cosmopolitanism, empty rationalism, and other denaturing characteristics. In other words, in some way, Evola is suggesting, at least in my view, that it was an error to blame the Jews and not instead to consider more carefully the non-Jewish sources of secularized modernity. To do so would be to privilege the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns over the Jewish question. We have three more chapters to cover. The theme of chapter five is worldview. Evola ascribes as a merit to national socialism that it felt the need to struggle for its worldview. 
But in defining the worldview, there was no success in achieving anything solid and unitary, especially with reference to the ethical, spiritual, and religious plane. He gives the example that National Socialism was opposed to every kind of atheism, but also turned against Christianity because of its Semitic or Hebraic strands. Evola calls the anti-Christian polemics, as well as the attempts to Aryanize Christianity, rationalizations and sophistries, or we might say ideological inconsistencies. Another example of a confused worldview is Hitler's Wagner infatuation. Since Hitler failed to recognize the degree to which, aside from the greatness of his romantic art, Wagner must be held accountable for the distortion of many Germanic and Nordic traditions and sagas. A third example is that whereas Nazi theorists saw in modern science a creation of the pure Aryan spirit, they unfortunately also failed to recognize that if technological conquests were due to modern science, so was the most destructive and irreversible spiritual devastation of the modern age, the desacralizing of the universe. Evola is particularly critical of the Nazi rejection of the division between body and soul, and hence its rejection of transcendence. A lack of comprehension for the dimension of transcendence constituted an insuperable handicap, even in the field of symbols, where, for instance, the restoration of ruins or ancient Germanic signs could not find its proper interpretation and was instead treated in a truly primitive and profane manner. About the swastika in particular, Evola writes that Hitler and his associates had absolutely no clue about notions concerning its orientation or the direction of its movement. In other words, they had no sense whatsoever of the spiritual significance of the symbolism that they were employing. Finally, where there did exist thoughtful books with a coherent worldview closer to the principles of the true teaching, official Nazi circles took no notice of them and willfully ignored them. In the next chapter, Evola discusses some ideas present in the German context that might have corrected Hitlerism in the direction of the true principles of the right. Two such ideas are the order, like the order of the Teutonic Knights, which formed the first small cell of Prussianism, and the Mannerbund, men's associations comprised of a cadre of elites, defined by an exclusively virile solidarity and a type of special chrism. Both the order and the association, the men's associations, were preferable to the party as the basis for a state. But although there were initiatives to develop a cultural order on these bases, they encountered a sort of handicap, as Evola writes, in the fact that an order in the true sense presupposes a chrism, a spiritual basis, which was lacking in Nazism. The topic of the last chapter is the ideology that was the foundation of the foreign policy of the Third Reich, and in particular of Hitler. Again, Evola states here that the most negative aspect of Hitlerism is represented by the fundamental and fatal part that the radicalism of irredentistic ethnic nationalism played in it. Hitler did not stop with ethnic national integration, but advanced in a direction close to a hegemonic pan-Germanism and inter-European colonialism based on the idea, false for Evola, of Aryan supremacy. Every properly Hitlerian component in German foreign policy for Evola worked against the true right ideal of a European new order that could have referred to an organic, solidary, and synergistic coordination of states and communities whose characteristic traits and independence were respected. So once again, the false idea of Aryan supremacy and the leveling centrality, totalizing equality, those two things affected the foreign policy. We're now at the end of Evola's study. His closing paragraph reminds us that there may be principles and ideas present in national socialism that should not be disowned today just because they figured in the Third Reich and were often distorted by it, as he writes. In short, for Evola, it's possible to reject many characteristic features of National Socialism and of Hitlerism, which you see that he's done, without automatically assuming that there was no principle or idea in it of any worth whatsoever, since all valuable ideas must be liberal democratic or leftist. It is this post-war democratic brainwashing, as he calls it, that he says has led to an incredible ideological vacuum in the worldview of present-day Germany and perhaps of the West more broadly. We, for our part, can regard Evola's books on Nazism and fascism as an effort to sort through the rubble of those defeated, discredited movements to uncover what, if anything, can be preserved for a true teaching that avoids their vulgar errors and theoretical confusions. This has been an overview of Julius Evola's notes on the Third Reich. My name is Michael Millerman. If you enjoyed this presentation, please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, 
and you can see my courses and other materials in the description below and at michaelmillerman.ca. Thanks for your time. See you in the next video.